All right, we can go ahead and kick this off. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Nicole Lashowski. I'm with Rumsey. Um, I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator. Uh, I just want to thank you guys all for joining us for the UVC Lighting Webinar. Um, goal of this webinar is to help everyone understand how to maintain a safe working environment with the help of the UVC Lighting products. Um, our presenter today is Jim Colantoni. Um, Jim is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Puro Lighting. Um, he's been with um, the industry for over 12 years in various sales leadership roles. Um, Jim also has over two years of experience specifically in UV lighting, um, and he's helping customers find the right fit for UV disinfection um, in their infection prevention strategy. So, um, without further ado, um, Jim, I'm going to pass it to you and you can get started. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I appreciate everybody's time today. Uh, so just a little background on Puro. So we launched the company in January 2019, um, so about 20 months ago, really with a focus on taking a really specialized ultraviolet light technology to market um, and really with the focus first on healthcare primarily. Um, so UV has been used for decades, so back to the 1930s in uh, the healthcare industry. Um, of course, in the 1930s, they were using it a little bit inappropriately, so they were getting lots of cornea burns, they were getting skin burns, they didn't really know what they were doing yet, even though it has been studied for over 140 years. So extremely studied technology um, that really over, I would say, the past 12 years has really um, hit its stride in the fact that most healthcare institutions around the country are using it in some respect, and I think the pandemic has really brought to light what can what else can we do to protect ourselves in every way from both viruses, uh, but also bacteria and other things that we're worried about in the future? Um, we're based out of Denver, Colorado and Lakewood, just outside of Denver. Um, I'm actually closer to the East Coast. I'm out of Columbus, Ohio, so probably a little bit closer to everybody on the call. So this is probably the biggest thing that I want to point out to everybody about UV. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about it, but um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, studies that have been done. There's been a lot of information that's been flowing on UV over the past two to three months through the pandemic. Um, I've been beat up for the past 20 months from the healthcare industry, which, you know, they, they need as much data as you can provide them. And then they need 10 more pieces of data after that. So our company has always done things in a very specific way. I would say a conservative way of the way we go to market and the way we tell people what we have to offer. So, so probably the biggest thing, if you're ever looking at UV, the first thing I ask somebody is, is your company EPA registered? Because UV devices are actually regulated by the EPA. Is your, is your device made in an EPA registered facility? Because both of those things have to be done. A lot of people say, oh, you don't need that. Or, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's in China, they do it. Um, you need this done in, in the United States in an EPA registered facility to really have some, some confidence in what you're doing. Then from a testing perspective, most devices are tested just at the bulb level itself, and it's from inches away. Um, so that's where there's all these studies being done now on the UV wands and all types of things like that that are on the market. Most of them either don't even have UV on the inside of them, or the UV is really insufficient. It's not enough actual UV. So it's really important to make sure that your device actually is the UV that it, ha that it needs to kill viruses, to inactivate viruses, uh, bacteria, mold, fungal, pathogens, et cetera. Uh, so we test our devices in EPA and FDA accredited laboratory, and we test the full device itself. Uh, so we actually are able to test uh, from distance, so not from two inches away, but from two meters or three meters or four meters away from the device itself. I'm just gonna see, Nicole, I don't know if there's a way we can mute everybody. Uh, until they want to ask questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so then the last thing I'll mention is we have actually, not only have we tested against all types of pathogens, but we've actually tested against uh, SARS-CoV-2, specifically the live virus. We did this in conjunction with uh, Columbia University out of New York. Actually, I actually have a second test going right now with another university. Um, and out of Columbia, this is the statement they released while it's in a peer-reviewed process. They did this in conjunction with the New York Transit Authority, so the subway and the bus system in New York, as well as uh, the facilities of the New York MTA. So you can see what Dr. David Brenner said here, that we're highly efficient at inactivating the virus. 
I'm going to skip through some of these slides just in the nature of time. Um, so I want to stop here for one second. It's very important for everyone to know that UV lighting, not different from electrostatic sprayers or misting or fogging systems, is an enhanced disinfection measure. It does not replace hand hygiene, which is sort of the first and foremost most important thing we can all be doing every day, uh, but then also manually cleaning a space. And I don't necessarily mean manually cleaning with chemicals, even though most people are going to continue to do that. Uh, I mean the physical wiping away of dust and dirt and debris. Whether you're using electrostatic sprayers or UV light, you can't clean through a pile of dirt. That pile of dirt needs to be actually removed, and then I can disinfect everything underneath it. But when you use something like UV light, you can uh, actually disinfect uh, at a much higher level, and you can do it. Uh, you can disinfect your surfaces with much uh, easier to handle substances like soap and water, for example. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the UV spectrum looks like. And I always like to point out here towards the top on the right, uh, this is the visible light spectrum at the very top. So 400 to 700 nanometers, you can see that light. Uh, whereas when you get below 400, you, you actually can't see UV light. So the UV light that's emitted from the sun, we don't actually see. Do you have any like duct tape and a Sharpie? I'm gonna mark these bins for uh, edge right here. Nicole, I don't know somebody that we still don't have. Um, let me see. Everyone, if you could just mute your mic if you're not speaking or asking a question, please. Thank you. It's like a art. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, so I can't, Nicole, I can't do it. I think you have to do it. Everyone's muted. I don't under, I don't see who is. Looks like it's Art Taylor. Please. All right, everybody. Okay. Uh, okay, so while we've got it, while we've got some quiet here, um, so. When you get to the UV spectrum, UVA is bactericidal. You're only going to have bacterial killing effects in that zone. UVB and UVC is when you start getting the germicidal effects. Uh, in UVC, there's a few spaces that matter. 265 nanometers on the spectrum is the most potent. 254, I always like to point out, because that's what typical germicidal tubes produce. That's the only wavelength they produce. And then 200 to 220 is really important because this is the spectrum of light uh, where you actually get the highest viral inactivation. So 200 nanometers is actually five times the viral inactivation power of 254, a standard germicidal tube. And why all this matters is our lighting system, so pulsed xenon is what it is called. Um, it's a non-hazardous chemical, right? Xenon is just a gas, unlike mercury, which is in most germicidal tubes. Uh, the pulse xenon source actually produces every wavelength that you see here. So we're able to get all the, the really strong effects of 200 nanometers, plus we get 254, plus we get 265, which is known to be the most potent against pathogens. This gives you a little bit of an idea of the different technologies as they exist. So you have low pressure mercury, you have medium pre pressure mercury. These both sort of look like fluorescent tubes, um, though they're blue. They have a blue hue to them rather than a fluorescent hue to them. And then pulse xenon. These are the only technologies you're going to see today for, uh, for whole room disinfection uh, that are really effective today. Um, again, probably the biggest difference I'll point out is uh, the mercury-based systems are... Uh, dramatically lower energy. So think of mercury sort of as a as a hose, whereas pulse xenon is about 4,000 times the energy in short microbursts of pulse of light. So think about it more like a pressure washer um, where you're really concentrating that energy and you're doing a much more with less. Um, so that's what pulse xenon is able to do. At the same time, because these pulses of light are so short, you don't get the damage to materials in the space. So the, the damage or the degradation to plastic. 
All right, so just quickly highlighting, um, this is how it's been done in hospitals for about 12 years. Uh, so large devices that you roll into the room, disinfect the room, move on to the next room. Xenex in the middle you see here is probably the number one across the country. It happens to use the same technology that we use, Pulse Xenon. Um, over on the left, uh, this is a device that's using uh, low pressure mercury vapor or medium pressure mercury vapor lamps. And what you can see the difference bet between the two, Xenex has one bulb on that device. It's able to disinfect rooms in, in a, an average size hospital room in five to 15 minutes. True D over on the left takes 25 to 52 minutes to disinfect that same room. So you can see how many more lamps you actually need uh, from a medium pressure mercury perspective to disinfect the same spaces. Just to, and lastly to point out, these devices are highly effective, highly studied by the CDC, Duke, UNC, healthcare institutions all over the country, um, but they're very expensive devices. So think $100,000 plus on all of these devices you see here, and then somewhere between five and $10,000 worth of annual maintenance on these units. All right, so what we did differently. So we took that, that Pulse Xenon technology, and then we, uh, with a specialized lensing technology, we're able to miniaturize the fixtures with still getting a dramatic amount of energy, UV energy specifically out of it. So we don't disinfect as fast as Xenex does because they pulse dramatically faster than we do. Uh, we pulse every six seconds, um, but we also, we took the cost down dramatically and then we removed maintenance from the units. So our unit has no maintenance for five to 10 years, depending on how much you run the units. Uh, so it really just gave us a, a big differenti differentiator between what's on the market. And then the devices are very small. So uh, the F1 over on the left is six inches by eight inches by two inches deep. The F2 is 24 inches by five inches by five inches deep. So both of them can be mounted on walls. They can be mounted in the ceiling. Uh, we have sheetrock flange kits. We have drop ceiling kits that we use. So lots of different options. And really what that does is it gives you automation of disinfection. I can disinfect this by installing it on the building automation system. We can use things like in-light air, where we can have wireless control systems on top of our system to control it and schedule it and do whatever you need to do with it. Um, we have that backnet compatibility that's built right into it. So lots of controllability by putting the units in the ceiling or on walls. Um, very low power consumption, even though you can see peak output. So that peak output is for about two um, every six seconds. So on average, we're actually less than an amp on the F1 and just over an amp on the F2. So really low power consumption over time, though. So think, uh, you know, two to three dollars worth of energy per year at nine cents kWh. Um, so take that up a little bit if the energy power is higher. So from a safety perspective, uh, always important that there's no UV light that's actually safe for humans yet. Um, there's some studies being done on individual wavelengths that might be that might be safe but we probably have to the tune of six months to 12 months before any of that is available. Um, so today we wanna make sure all of our fixtures are off when somebody's in the space because we are using this broad spectrum of UV light. So we run a diagnostic cycle first, that gives you 60 seconds worth of checking the components within the fixture to make sure everything's operating correctly with the software. And then um, you can see that little black dot on each fixture, that's an occupancy sensor. So if somebody is in the space or enters the space, um, while the units are about to operate or while they're operating, the units will turn themselves off. And then I mentioned this pulse of light over a couple times. It's two milliseconds pulse of light. So over the course of an entire 30 minute period of time, you actually only get about two seconds of UV exposure. So that's enough to destroy microorganisms, but it's really not enough to do any damage to materials, even over uh, multiple years of use every single day. Um, we would never recommend exposing this to humans. That's why we have the safety precautions. Uh, but if a human got a flash of light, um, it's not going to be detrimental to them either. This gives you a little bit of an idea of how we lay out the spaces. Um, so we can do this in-house. Uh, we have lighting agents uh, like Justin uh, with illuminations that's on the line right now. Uh, they can help with this designing as well to make sure that the space, you know, if you have a, a warehouse or you have an office building or you have a hospital, that wants to say, hey, how many units do I need of this? If we have a, a reflected ceiling plan, or if we have something like that, um, some sort of drawings, we can actually tell you how many units to use and where to use them. 
Uh, so since the pandemic, uh, we have had sort of an influx of, of desire and need to deploy very quickly and to multiple areas. Um, so we do have the ability to take our fixtures and mount them onto customized carts and tripods as well. Um, the way the units are designed, it's very simple to do that. They're very light. Uh, the tripods uh, would be anywhere from 10 to 14 pounds. So if you want to take them up and down stairs, it's not a big deal. And then places like surgery centers, hospitality hotels, um, they're using our, our rolling carts so that they can roll them through the space and they can uh, get into those spaces, disinfect, and then move on to the next room. So this is probably 50 to 60% of our sales right now is people that want to deploy them in multiple areas at the same time. And this is the less expensive route, right? If you install it in your entire facility, you're gonna spend a good deal of money to deploy this technology, um, but it's the best way to do it because you can disinfect on demand or on a schedule whenever you want to, whenever you need to. Amy had COVID, let's disinfect Amy's office um, and anywhere Amy was. You can do that all with a click of a button with our installed fixtures versus the mobile units. You can't disinfect the whole space at the same time. You gotta sort of move from room to room. Uh, but both are very effective options, and these are options that are dramatically less expensive than uh, the portable units that I showed you earlier from Zenax and Trudy and others. I'll pause for a second. Any questions from anybody right now that I can answer, whether it's the installed units or the mobile units? Hey, I got a question about the uh, Pulse Xenon technology. So are you using the same technology as the one you showed on the you know, the one, the previous uh, picture where they use at the hospitals, the same technology or is it a different one? The one uh, yeah, so they're both Pulse Xenon technology, so exact same technology. We both are a broad spectrum UV light source. Um, the only difference between us and them is they, they are pulsing their light multiple times per second or close to multiple times per second, about one and a half times per second. We pulse ours every six seconds. So their disinfection time is faster than ours. Um, but our units last longer and are much less expensive. Got it. Yep. Any other questions on the on the fixtures or the mobile units I can answer right now before I move on? Okay, we'll keep going. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of what coverage areas look like, and you can see the goal is always sort of overlap those coverage areas as best we can, even when we install the units versus use them mobily. But if we have drawings, we can show you exactly how much space we're able to disinfect and how often we're able to disinfect it. I do want to talk about air handlers. Um, this has been a, a key point for a lot of people right now is to get UV into their air handling system, into their HVAC systems. Uh, the only space that we really focus on today is air handlers and it's larger commercial air handlers. Um, we're showing a picture of a, a pretty good size one. So this could be smaller. This could be, you know, rather than six feet across, this could actually be two or three feet across. Um, the coil size doesn't have to be this big. Um, a lot of times it's more rectangular. This just is showing you what the maximum that we're comfortable with. So if this was, uh, you know, six by 12, you know, we might use two units to get the coverage area. Uh, on the width side of things, you know, a bigger width side. Um, but in general, our systems are really the safest on the market with our sensors shut off. Uh, they're the fastest to install. So think days to install versus hours to install our units if, if it takes that long. And then uh, extremely effective at doing everything we need for coil disinfection, which is what we're trying to do here, actually disinfect these coils um, in two hours a day. So what that leads to is about 99% energy save versus traditional mercury vapor style systems without any of the hazardous chemicals of mercury uh, at the same time. So this ends up being thousands of dollars a year in energy savings for the customer while it gives them the efficiency pickup of their HVAC system and a cleaner HVAC system as well. Um, and then, so I talked about the energy savings, but also the longevity. So this will be about a four to five times the life uh, expectancy of a mercury vapor style system. So this just gives you a, a really good idea of all the spaces that were uh, actually installed in today. And I think, um, Nicole, you can let me know, but I think this is either being recorded and or this can be shared with everybody afterwards. So you can take a look at all these different types of facilities. Um, it's recorded. Okay, great. Um, so obviously anything healthcare is using these pretty extensively. The hospitality industry is, is pretty big right now. 
Elevators are being used from a disinfection perspective. Um, Long-term care facilities, fitness centers, uh, major sporting facilities. So we have an NHL team that's about to deploy um, some of our units. Uh, Mass Transit has been a a very big customer of ours, probably 12 major uh, transit authorities across the country that we're working with. Uh, Food manufacturing plants, entertainment venues, um, lots of places that you can use UV. This gives you a little bit of an idea of what they look like in the ceiling. So over on the left, you can see some a conference room install. Uh, this is our older flange kit. Over on the right, you can see what they look like today. They've got a really nice white finish to them. Um, that can be in a drop ceiling, or this could be in a sheetrock ceiling. We can do the exact same thing. Um, over on the in the middle, you can see what it looks like uh, for disinfection of uh, you know, office spaces using the portable units. This is what our new portable unit looks like. Really nice white finish to it. Um, so this can, again, be deployed in all types of facilities. <clears throat> this gives you a, look, a little idea of what it looked like in the New York subway system and the bus system. Uh, you can see over on the left, um, using the tripods actually on buses, um, in the on the two right pictures, you can see actually mounting these. We have custom mounting brackets that can mount these to stanchion poles. Um, we can mount these to walls using standard TV mounts, so visa mounts are what they're called. So lots of flexible ways to deploy these units. So uh, from a marketing perspective, we have had a, a lot of interest from our customers of I want to tell people that we are using a non-chemical form of disinfection every single day to protect them from both something like COVID-19, but also uh, other types of viruses and bacteria in the space. You know, think about kitchen areas where they're worried about E. coli and other types of foodborne illnesses. Uh, We have either co-branded opportunities with uh, customers on this type of thing, or they can just use our our small uh, logos, look sort of like a security uh, sticker that you put on the door. Um, I see these all over the place now, um, so we can help deploy this and, and really work with marketing teams to make sure people know that you're protecting your spaces um, with uh, extra extra measures. And then really just the last thing I'll mention, and then I think we've got a, a slide for Rumsey at the end. Um, we started this company with really wanting to help people, right? And uh, most people don't understand how bad infections are in the healthcare industry. Um, Maybe you do, because typically if I'm in a room and I say, you know, has anybody, you know, had a a relative or themselves that have gone to the hospital for something that seemed routine, and then they got sicker, right? They got some sort of what they call healthcare acquired infection. Um, And usually there's one or two people that raise their hand, and some people have lost relatives to things like this. Um, I think it's about 100,000 people a year die from hospital acquired or healthcare acquired infections. So we started with the goal of helping to protect people in those spaces. And, and now through the pandemic, we're doing this in schools, we're doing this in universities, we're doing this in uh, preschools, right? So anywhere we can go to help protect people right now is what we're trying to do. And then, I'm Nicole, I'm gonna let you uh, sort of wrap things up. Um, we can see if we have any other questions that are left over. Okay, I think the wrap up is on me. This is Jim Presto. <laughs> Um, this is Jim Presto. I'm with Rumsey Electric. Uh, work with Nicole. Um, I'm actually in the sales part of the sales team. So, um, but I do I do have one question. Um, can you do me a favor on the air handlers? Because we had this conversation through this whole process. We have gotten questions from customers regarding um, uh, purification of air ducts um, versus like the air handler you had there. Do we want to uh, differentiate them? um now so that we can or clarify that for for everybody or yeah so what i think is important to think about with air it takes a lot of energy to disinfect moving air um if i am trying to disinfect the air in a cafeteria very easy right because i can turn my lights on the air is fairly static in that environment we're going to disinfect it extremely well but when you get inside an air handler or the spaces that are more like work where moving faster than the Jim, sorry, it's, it's super loud. <laughs> sorry, I'm uh, sorry. Um, uh, it, when it's moving really fast, it's really hard to disinfect. So you have to have, uh, I'll tell you, most air handlers need tens 
of thousands of dollars worth of UVC to disinfect the air itself. Um, now, disinfection of the coil is important in an air handler because if you disinfect the coil, you stop the mold and the fungal growth that happens naturally in these dark, wet environments, which then prevents viruses and bacteria from landing on that mold, using it as a host, and then spreading. So if you can keep that coil clean, you actually keep the air quality dramatically higher. Not to mention this mold is sometimes black mold, right, which is flowing through the air handler and causing people to get sick too. Um, so you want to make sure that you are doing everything you can there. Um, and then if you're looking at UVC for uh, either in duct work or things like that, you need to make sure you have a really high energy system to accomplish that. Um, and, and again, it's not going to be a couple thousand thousand dollars. It's usually going to be tens of thousands, things 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars to disinfect the air itself. Um, and then lastly, I'll mention, you know, there's a lot of people that are selling air purifiers, right, just for the space themselves. Um, if they have HEPA filters, that's great. They're going to work extremely well. Um, if they have UV, uh, the CFMs should typically be two to five CFMs. If it's moving faster than that, if the air is, the UV is not really doing much uh, for that disinfection. So if it's moving really fast through the system, it's, again, it's not going to do much. Does that help, Jim? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I guess what I, what I wanted to first do is thank uh, Puro and uh, Illuminations for setting this up. Um, and I guess I'll let you know from an advertisement or uh, um, Illuminations, our, our, our rep agency for Puro has uh, some of these fixtures installed at their offices. If anybody wanted to uh, actually go on site and see them, they're more than welcome to set that up. So. Um, the goal, the goal of today was really um, to kind of talk through some safety measures uh, against bacteria and COVID um, because it's on the mind of everybody. And I know that a lot of the, you know, some of the slides that people think about are in commercial, uh, institutional, and um, I think Puro does a pretty good job with mass transit. But from a from the perspective of you know cafeterias, coffee areas. Um, you know, everybody has those it's areas where we have a lot of people that will congregate at some course during the course of the day and just kind of, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're open to working through any of these, uh, any of these things that you're thinking about. It's kind of the goal was to kind of give you a little bit of an education, give you an idea of what Puro had to offer from a solution perspective. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out and talk to us. And, um, uh, there's our phone number there. Uh, you can contact your uh, your sales rep uh, directly. Um, so, or you just call into our our number and ask for uh, some presto. Um, we also, if you look at um, there's a web link there. We're also going to send out a short survey just to kind of get your feedback on on today and whether it was worth it, and then maybe some questions. So you could also use that as an opportunity to uh, to engage us and and have uh, have a conversation. Um, to do any kind of layout, you know, consultation or, or any kind of dilemma you may have from a, uh, a you know, a, a facility safety perspective. So, again, we appreciate everybody's time uh, coming attending today. And, uh, you know, if you have any other future questions, either now or down the road, please, by all means, um, let us know. So, and it looks like, uh, it looks like uh, Nicole just put the uh, link for the survey in the, in the chat if you want to access it that way. I got a question for Jim, um, if I can. Sure. Yeah, so I think the slide number 14 and 17, where it shows the coverage uh, based on the square footage, you use a number of those units. Um, how do we know that the virus is getting killed? Like, how do you know the certification? Is there any certification or something you can prove that, hey, uh, by using these devices, the virus <laughs> in that area, like it could be conference room, office space, or anything like that. Like, a, what? How do you measure it? The effectivity. So, so I think the best thing to do is to note. Well, the most important thing to note is this is an adjunct technology, right? So we are we are putting these devices in spaces to to take that space to the next level. Uh, you still have to manually clean the space, right? Um, and you can do that before or after the clean. A lot of people are doing the UV first so they can protect their employees, their cleaning employees 
as well. Um, you know, from an airborne virus, they're trying to disinfect the air. But this is not 100% going to always uh, disinfect every single virus that's in a space. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can to make sure we're doing as best as we can. Now, in terms of proof, um, so we have clinical validation studies that we have done. So with a third party EPA, FDA accredited laboratory. Um, so with customers uh, that are engaged, we're happy to share that data. And then um, we also have the ability to actually meter how much UV is actually in the space. So the meters are very expensive. Uh, but we do have a few of those meters. So if we're, you know, if we're engaged with a customer, um, we can bring those meters into the space and we can actually say, hey, look, even in this corner, you're able to get this much UV. Or you know what, under this bed, because of the shadowed areas and because you don't have any reflections getting underneath here, you know, you're not gonna get UV here. Um, but I can tell you, we've actually metered it for uh, a very large metropolitan um, transit authority and even in completely shadowed areas, they were still getting enough UV dosage to inactivate SARS-CoV-2. Um, so based on what we recommend from a distance and a mounting height perspective, we are trying to be extremely conservative uh, that you're going to get that disinfection. Now, the other question I have is the, I think one of the slides you mentioned about uh, two seconds of UV, like a one to two seconds every 30 minute cycle. So when it's flashing, I mean, is it gonna blind someone or I mean, how intense the light lighting is? So it is it is a very bright light. Um, I'm gonna see if I can pull up one of the videos to show you. It's a very bright light. If you're behind a window or glass or, or anything like that, you're outside the space, uh, the UV light does not penetrate that. So you'll be perfectly safe, but it's still a bright light and we wouldn't recommend anybody's looking at that. Um, if you're in the space and you're staring at it, you 100% will have uh, UVC damage of some sort. Um, if you sit there and stare at it for a long period of time, without a question. Uh, so we would never recommend that somebody's in the space when our units are operating. And that is why we have the safety precautions to make sure that they're off if somebody is in that space. So let's say that conference call taking place, which could be maybe 45 minutes an hour. So I think you install those devices such a way that it doesn't blind people, I guess. Uh, correct, yeah. So we would only disinfect when nobody was there. And again, you could either schedule that throughout the day or say a conference room, right? You would you could have switches on the walls that would read, first of all, is anybody in the space? If nobody's in the space, um, then you can turn the units on. And then again, the system itself will still be checking to make sure nobody's there but the units will run that full cycle and that would be 15 minutes or 30 minute cycles. And once that's done, the units won't operate again until they're told to operate again. Um, and I actually do have a video. This is a little bit crude of a video. So, you know, I apologize for that. But this is uh, on a subway system. Or it's actually a light rail system um, that we actually just deployed in. Um, so I'm gonna show you. It's a little bit difficult to see, and I'm going to fast forward here a little bit so you can see the units set up. And so this is actually them running their diagnostic cycle. So you see purple flashing light on the units. And then I'm going to fast forward and you'll actually see the flashing lights. So it is a it is a very bright light. Uh, that you do not want to be in the space with, but that that bright light every time you see that flash is two milliseconds of UV exposure. Does that help a little bit? Yep, it kind of clarifies the questions I had. Excellent. I th I actually think the question of. Uh... You know how long? How long do I need to have the light on for to you know to to sanitize or do what I need to do? Uh, Jim, I'm going to try to. Hopefully, you know this, but uh, we kind of got an email on a um, study report: antimicrobial effectiveness of Puro devices. Um, we're going to we can send this out to everybody who attended, um, but it goes through. Just scanning through this, it goes through different types of microorganisms. Is there any chance you can talk to this? Do you, do you know the study report? I know I'm, cold, I'm catching you cold on this, but 
Uh, yeah. So, so just in general, we have tested and we typically ask um, that this doesn't go out until we're actually engaged with the customer. Um, but this is going to show basically from an EPA, FDA accredited laboratory, various viral pathogens, fungal pathogens, um, uh, viral and bacterial pathogens, how long it takes us to disinfect and to what level. Um, I'll even say some of the data is a little dated. So our devices actually are much stronger than some of that data. So that's why it's good to talk to me about what are you actually concerned about? Um, and then I will tell you in about three to four weeks, we will have uh, actual releasable data on SARS-CoV-2 and actual dosage requirements. So again, when I tell you I can disinfect a room and I can actually put a dosage meter in there, uh, we do have a university that's given us actual dosage um, on that. So we'll have that very soon. Thank you. Um, anybody have any other questions? We appreciate the questions, though, too. Um, questions, comments? So with that, I think uh, we'll, again, thank Jim. Thank you, Justin, uh, for setting this up. Um, we thank all of you for all your time, and uh, let us know if uh, we can help you in any way. Thank you, everybody, very much.